Chapter 2 is titled Kinematics in One Dimension. In this chapter, I will discuss the different quantities that are used to describe the motion of an object in one dimension. So, the science of moving objects has two branches. One is known as kinematics, which deals with the concepts that are needed to describe motion. And the other branch is called dynamics, which deals with the effect that forces have on motion. And together, kinematics and dynamics form a branch of physics, which is known as mechanics. And this first part of the course is mainly focused on mechanics, which means that throughout most of this course, we are going to deal with both kinematic and dynamic um, quantities. So let's begin the lecture by defining the position of an object in space. So first I need to introduce a one-dimensional reference frame or coordinate system, and that would be a straight line with positive orientation to the right and negative orientation to the left. And of course, there is a origin in that coordinate system, which I'm going to label with O. So in that coordinate system, I can find the position of any object by assigning a position vector to that object. So for example, if I have an object at point A, the position vector that defines the position of this object in this one-dimensional coordinate system has its tail at the origin and its head at the position of the object A. And so this position vector I can label, let's say, with X. And so X is a position vector. And that is of is a position vector at point A. So similarly, I can have a completely different point somewhere else on the coordinate system, for example, right here, point B. So then I can assign a different position vector. Let's use blue. And let's call this one x1. And so x1 is the position vector at point B. And so on and so forth. So um, I can use position vectors to define the position of a moving object at different times during the motion. So for example, um, let's look at the motion of a car along a straight line. And I'm going to consider two different positions as the car is moving in positive x direction. So initially the car is somewhere here on the road, and I'll call this initial position. And so I can assign position vector to that initial position, which I can call, let's say, x0. And then as the car is moving, it reaches some other position down the road, which I will call final position. And so I can assign a different position vector to that final position. Let's just call it x. And so now that I have defined the position of the car as it's moving down the road at those two different points, the initial position and the final position. So now I can define a very important uh, physical quantity, which is called displacement, 
and it's used to define um, velocity and from there acceleration as well. So let's look at this car moving again down the road in positive effects direction. So the car is initially at position defined by the position vector x0 and then the car moves a certain amount of time down the road and the new position is defined by the position vector x and so I can then define a vector quantity which is called displacement which is labeled with delta x as the difference between the initial position vector, I'm sorry, the final position vector minus the initial position vector. So the final position vector minus the initial position vector. So the definition of displacement is the straight line distance between two positions during the motion of an object. So one more time, displacement is the straight line distance between two positions during the motion of an object. As I um, mentioned in the first uh, chapter lecture, displacement and distance traveled are not always the same. The only time the displacement and the distance traveled are the same is when the distance is along a straight line, uh, when, the, when the path is along a straight line. If we have motion between two points in space, let's call them A and B, that is not along the straight line, then the distance traveled would be different than the displacement. So the displacement is the straight line, this straight line distance between two points in space or two positions in space. And the length of path traveled can be the same as the displacement if the uh, motion is along a straight line. Otherwise, they are not the same. So again, from the name of this chapter, we are dealing with one dimensional motion. So um, to make things fairly straightforward, most of the time we are going to have problems with objects moving along a straight line. So displacement and distance of path will be the same thing, but not... Uh, 100% of the time. There will be some problems where that is not the case. Now I want to show you a few example calculations of displacement based on the values of the initial and final positions. So here we have a moving object that is initially at 2 meters from the origin. 2 meters from the origin, so the position vector has magnitude of 2 meters uh, at the initial position. And then um, after some time, the object is seven meters from the origin. So the new position vector at the final position is seven meters. And so by the definition of displacement, the displacement is equal to the final position minus the initial position. So that would be seven meters minus two meters, that is five meters. And so as you can see, since both displacement vector, uh, since uh, both position vectors point to the right, which is the positive x direction, the displacement, uh, the resultant displacement vector also points in positive x direction. And therefore, as we can see from the result here, um, we have a positive sign in front of the value of the displacement vector. And so, in general, when you have the initial position um, shorter distance from the origin and the final position a larger distance from the origin, the displacement is a positive number. Now, let's see what happens when the roles are reversed. So, here we have the initial position is at 7 meters from the origin and the final position is at 2 meters from the origin. So, the initial position is further away from the origin and the final position is closer to the origin. So again, I calculate the displacement by using the definition, the difference between the final position and the initial position. So that would be two meters minus seven meters. Now I get negative five meters. So the displacement now points in uh, 
negative x direction. And that orientation comes through in the result with that minus sign. So the sign in front of the result when we are calculating vector quantities is extremely important because that is the indication of direction um, of that vector quantity. So positive sign in front of the vector quantity, uh, calculated vector quantity, means that the vector is oriented towards positive direction, and the negative sign means that the vector is oriented towards negative direction. And here there is one more example that I wanted to show, which is that the initial position is in negative x direction, so negative 2 meters, meaning 2 meters from the origin in negative direction. And the final position is 5 meters from the origin in positive direction. So that is plus 5 meters. So calculating the displacement using, again, the definition gives me 5 meters minus minus 2 meters, and that is total of 7 meters of displacement. And the displacement points in positive x direction. So here, the initial position has a negative value, and so when you do the calculation using the definition for displacement, you must include the minus sign Otherwise, you're going to get the wrong answer for the displacement. So from these two examples, uh, it is very clear that the proper signs must be used when calculations are performed, when vector quantities are involved. Because, again, the difference between a plus and a minus sign means the difference in orientation towards positive direction or negative direction. All right, so now I'm ready to introduce another quantity that describes motion, and that is the average speed. So average speed is defined as the distance traveled divided by the time required to cover that distance. So average speed is equal to distance divided by the uh, elapsed time. And in formula form, um, that will be the average is equal to d divided by t. So this is a typical notation for average velocity and d for distance. The units that are used for speed in the metric system are meters per second. So the distance will be always measured in meters and the time in seconds. So speed is a scalar quantity. It just tells us how fast an object was moving. It does not give information about direction because distance is not a vector quantity. It's just the length of path that the object has traveled during that time. So one more time, average velocity is a scalar quantity. I'm um, sorry, um, average speed is a scalar quantity. You can think of the um, speed as sort of the magnitude of the velocity of a moving object. So that's another way to think about it. But again, it's a scalar quantity because it's defined as the ratio of the distance traveled, which is just the length of path, divided by the elapsed time. And so here, there is a very simple example that illustrates the use of this um, definition for average speed. Um, the question is, how far does a jogger run in one and a half hours if his average speed is 2.22 meters per second? So the average speed is calculated as the distance divided by the elapsed time. So that would be, um, from here to calculate the distance, we must multiply the average speed by the elapsed time. So the average speed is 2.22 meters per second, but the time of the run is given in hours. So as you can see, the units for, the time units in those two quantities are not the same. So the average speed is measured in meters per second, 
and the time of the run in hours. So seconds and hours not compatible. So in order to do the calculation properly, it's important to convert the units to be the same. So uh, the conversion that we will do is hours into seconds. And so one hour has 3,600 seconds. Therefore, 1.5 hours have 5,400 seconds. And so 2.22 meters per second times 5,400 seconds. When I cancel the time units here and here, give me 12,000 meters. Average, um, average speed, again, is a scalar quantity. It only gives us information about how fast moving object was going between two points in space. Now, if I want to figure out what is, how fast an object was going at a specific moment of time, then I need to um, first define average velocity. So now this is a vector quantity, which is defined as the displacement which was also a vector quantity divided by elapsed time. So average velocity is a vector quantity because it is defined as the displacement, which is also a vector quantity divided by the elapsed time. So that means that average velocity gives us more information than average speed. Average speed is simply the magnitude of the average velocity. So how do we calculate the average velocity? Well, the average velocity, which we label as a vector with v and an arrow uh, above it, is equal to the displacement, final position minus initial position, divided by the time between those two final position uh, between those two positions. So that will be the time at the final position minus the time at the initial position. So this ratio can be also written as the displacement delta x divided by the time interval delta t. The units still remain the units of distance divided by the units of time, so that would be meters per second in the metric system. How do we represent the average velocity graphically? Well, I can plot the graph of position versus time for a moving object. And let's say that um, the trajectory of motion looks like this random curve here. So I can select two points um, along the path of this moving object. Let's call them points A and B. And so point A is a distance x0 from the origin and point B is a distance x from the origin. Of course, I can also assign position vectors to those two points, so let's do that as well. So the position vectors are x0 and x. So now by the definition of displacement, I can also um, draw a displacement vector. And so this displacement vector will be like so. So that is delta x. Okay, on the other hand, I also know the times at which that moving object's object was at points A and B. So the object where it was at point A at time called T0 measured from the beginning of the motion right here from the origin. And point B is at time stamp T. And so the difference between those two timestamps, t minus t0, is the elapsed time delta t. And so now, if I take the ratio of delta x to delta t, that will be the average uh, velocity. So what is the graphical meaning of average velocity from this plot here. 
that would be the slope of this um, curve between those two points. That's what it is. Now let's look at an example calculation that shows how average velocity is calculated. So Andy Green was a test driver trying to set a world record for the fastest uh, speed with a car. And so to establish the record, he drove, he made two runs throughout the course, one in each direction to nullify the effects of wind. And so both runs are represented in those two drawings. So first he drove in positive um, x direction, starting from initial time 0 seconds until final time of 4.740 seconds. And the displacement during that interval was 1,609 meters. Then he went the other way, started at time t equals 0 seconds and finished at time 4.695 seconds. The displacement was again 1,609 meters, but now in negative direction, therefore the minus sign here in front of the value of the displacement. So now let's calculate the average velocities in each case. So when the motion was in positive direction, the average velocity is equal, was equal to 1,609 meters divided by 4.740 seconds, or that is 339.5 meters per second. When the motion was in negative x direction, the average velocity was minus 342.7 meters per second. And so when those two results were averaged, that's how the world record was calculated for uh, the fastest uh, moving car. Now, one more time, I want to um, emphasize the significance of the minus sign here. So in general, not in general, but in reality, there is no such thing as negative velocity because velocity is a physical quantity that can be measured. And it's always a positive number. However, since that is a vector quantity, we must introduce directions in our reference frame. And so the minus sign simply means motion in negative direction of what we have assigned to be the negative direction. Nothing more, nothing less. That's the only thing that it means. So I defined graphically average velocity, but what if I wanted to know the velocity of motion of the object at just a single moment of time as the object is moving. For example, at point A or at point B or at another point. Just that, not the average velocity between two different points. Well, if I wanted to um, be able to find that particular parameter of the motion, then I would have to introduce a new quantity which is called called instantaneous velocity. So how do, is the instantaneous velocity uh, calculated? Well, if I take the position of the moving object at two different points uh, along the trajectory, um, I can calculate the average velocity. But if I start to shrink the time interval between the two positions, that essentially brings the two positions closer and closer to each other. So if initially the object was here and here, let's say position one and position two, in the, the time interval between those two positions as the object moves is, you know, some amount of time. If I bring the two positions closer to each other, that will reduce the time it takes to get between the, uh, from position one to position two. So we have position one here now, and then position two here. So it takes less time to get between those two points. Well, I can shrink the distance between the two even more 
and bring point two right here. So then that will decrease the time to travel between two points even more. Well, what if I decrease the distance between the two points so much that practically they are the same point? Then that will um, be the same as making the time interval to get from point one to point two be um, almost zero. So when that happens, we are saying, then we say that now I'm calculating the instantaneous velocity of the object at that particular point. And so if that is the point in question, the instantaneous velocity will be the slope of the straight line that is tangent to the curve at that point. So that is all that it really means. So the instantaneous velocity is simply the slope of a tangent to the trajectory at any moment of time. This uh, quantity gives us a lot more information than the average velocity because now I can calculate it at any point during the motion as opposed to the average velocity which was calculated between two different points during the motion. Now dealing with instantaneous velocity requires knowledge of calculus and so we are not going to really uh, use that um, quantity in this course. However, it's important to understand the meaning of it, especially for those of you that may have to take the calculus-based uh, physics course. Let's now introduce another quantity that is used to describe motion, and that is the acceleration. So acceleration is a quantity that emerges when a change in velocity happens over time. So let's look at this jet plane right here. So it starts at some initial velocity v0 and the timestamp is t0 when the velocity is measured. And then this jet airplane will accelerate in positive direction with some acceleration which we label with a. And then after some time has elapsed, this jet has a different velocity now, and let's call it v. So then if I take the difference between the new velocity and the starting velocity, in other words, final velocity minus initial velocity, and divide that by the time interval between the two positions, that defines the average acceleration a. So the average acceleration is equal to the change in velocity, final minus initial, divided by the elapsed time for that change to occur. So the average acceleration is equal to delta v divided by delta t. What are the units of acceleration? The units of acceleration will be the units for velocity, which were meters per second, divided by the units for time, which is seconds. Um, this is also abbreviated as meters per second squared. And so the acceleration has the meaning of how many meters per second does the object accelerate every second. So for example, two meters per second squared means that the moving object increases its speed of motion by two meters per second every second. And so here is an example of calculation of average acceleration. So we have a um, jet airplane starting from rest and taking off at 260 kilometers per hour, where uh, the time of the um, acceleration before takeoff is 29 seconds. So let's calculate the acceleration of this jet airplane. So that would be the difference between final and initial velocity. So that would be 260 kilometers per hour. 
minus zero, uh, zero meters per second divided by 29 seconds. So here we have um, a small hurdle to overcome and that is the different units in the velocities. Um, since there is no requirement that the answer is in a specific unit, I'm going to rewrite the initial velocity in units of kilometers per hour. So zero meters per second is obviously equal to zero, zero kilometers per hour. And so then the difference between the two velocities will be 260 kilometers per hour minus zero kilometers per hour. Divide that by 29 seconds and we get nine kilometers per hour per second. So this is the acceleration of this jet airplane. So this number here again means that the jet accelerates uh, the jet speeds up by 9 kilometers per hour every second. The positive sign indicates that the motion is in, um, that the acceleration is in the same direction as the motion of the airplane. And so it speeds up. And so here is a um, cartoon that shows exactly what the acceleration means. So at the beginning, the airplane is at rest, zero meters per second velocity. And then after one second, after the airplane started moving, the velocity is nine kilometers per hour. At the second second, uh, after the start of motion, the velocity is 18 kilometers per hour and so on and so forth. So the acceleration of nine kilometers per hour per second means that the airplane is speeding up by nine kilometers per hour every second. Okay, let's look at a different example where the acceleration is opposite to the direction of motion of the um, object. So a drag racer crosses the finish line and the driver uh, deploys a parachute and applies the brakes to slow down. So the driver begins slowing down when the initial time is nine seconds and the velocity of the car is 28 meters per second in positive direction. When the time is 12 seconds, the velocity has been reduced to 13 meters per second. And so the question is, what is the average acceleration of this, uh, this dragster? Okay. So by definition, the acceleration is calculated as different in velocities, final minus initial, divided by the time interval between the two uh, velocity values. The final velocity is 13 meters per second. The initial velocity is 28 meters per second. So we have 13 meters per second minus 28 meters per second. And the time interval between the two is calculated as 12 seconds minus 9 seconds. So this um, gives us negative 5 meters per second squared. So what does that mean? That means that if the drag, uh, the dragster is going to the right in post effects direction, because of the deployment of the parachute, it's slowing down, which then essentially is the same as um, the dragster accelerating with acceleration pointing in negative direction. Essentially, the acceleration is opposing the direction of motion. The dragster is moving to the right. The acceleration is pointing to the left. As a result, the dragster is losing um, velocity. And so that is the significance of the minus sign here. The acceleration is in direction opposite to the direction of motion. This is a result of the fact that the acceleration is a vector quantity. So the minus sign is important. So the definitions of average velocity and acceleration are shown here uh, on the top of the slide. And these definitions include vector notation. Now, when we do calculations, though, um, we use the magnitudes of those vector quantities when we want to um, solve a problem. We do not, um, we don't know the actual vector, meaning uh, we know the magnitude and we know the direction. So in order to calculate, we must use magnitudes. And so 
the equations can be written in simplified form as simply v equals to x minus x0 divided by t minus t0, no vector notation, and a is equal to v minus v0 divided by t minus t0, no vector notation. So as you already saw in the examples that I showed, the directionality for these vector quantities here comes from the sign of the result of the calculation. A positive sign indicates the vector points in positive direction. A negative sign indicates that the vector points in negative direction. So we don't lose any information by switching to this type of notation, but now it gets more simplified as to what exactly uh, are we supposed to be doing based on the information provided in a problem. In a problem, you get positions uh, values or velocity values. You do not get vector values. But in a sense, those are the same things based on the nature of the quantities calculated. And so from now on, we are going to switch to that type of notation. However, we will mean that type of notation and definition. In this course, we are going to also consider motion, which happens with constant acceleration. We are not, not going to deal with problems where the acceleration changes over time. And so um, this allows us to write some specific equations that can be used to solve problems about the kinematics of motion of objects. So we have five kinematic variables that are important for those equations. We have the displacement x, we have the acceleration a, which is a constant quantity. We have a final velocity v, we have initial velocity v0, and we have elapsed time t. So let's list the equations of kinematics that um, are useful for solving problems relating, uh, related to motion of objects. And so the four kinematic equations are as follows. The final velocity is equal to initial velocity plus acceleration times time. This equation allows us to calculate um, one of those four quantities when we know the other three. The second equation is that the uh, displacement x is equal to one half the sum of the two velocities initial and final times the time, uh, the elapsed time. The third equation is the displacement is equal to initial velocity times time plus acceleration times time to the second power divided by two. And the last equation is the final velocity to the second power is equal to the initial velocity to the second power plus two times acceleration times displacement. So these equations allow us to find one quantity if we know the other three. So when you're solving a problem um, involving kinematics of motion with constant acceleration, you always are going to refer to that list, determine which quantities the problem provides and which quantity is the problem asking for, and then find out which of those equations will um, give you the answer and use it. When the acceleration of motion is a positive number, then of course, when you're doing calculations with the formulas that have acceleration, you're going to um, replace that positive number in those formulas. However, if the acceleration has a negative value, you're going to accordingly replace that value with the minus sign in those formulas and calculate the result. So again, the signs are very important because acceleration and velocity are vector quantities. So you always have to be careful about these so that you can get correct answers to the problems that you are working on. Let's look at one example of application of an equation from uh, kinematics with constant acceleration. So this is a speedboat that initially is moving with 6 meters per second <clears throat> and acceleration of 2 meters per second squared. After 8 seconds of motion, 
how uh, what what is what was the displacement of the speedboat? So what distance did the speedboat travel? So we have a constant acceleration in this problem. We know the initial velocity. We know the time of travel. So therefore, from the list of equations, I find that equation number three has all the components or ingredients, plus it calculates what I'm looking for. It has initial velocity, it has time of motion, it has the acceleration, and it calculates my final, uh, my distance of travel or displacement. So that is the equation right here. So let's substitute the known quantities. Six meters per second times eight seconds plus one half of two meters per second squared times eight seconds to the second power. And when you calculate that, you should get 110 meters with a positive sign. Let's look at this uh, example as well. So we have an aircraft carrier and a jet plane is taking off, starting from rest. So that's the initial velocity of zero meters per second. The acceleration of the jet is 31 meters per second squared. And in order for the jet to safely take off without falling in the water, uh, it reaches velocity of 62 meters per second. So the question is how long should be the deck of this aircraft carrier for this jet to be able to take off safely? So the information that I know is the initial velocity, the final velocity, and the acceleration. And I'm looking for this, the distance traveled. And I don't know anything about the time that it took to get from the starting position to the takeoff position. So looking at the equations of kinematics, I see in the list an equation that has all of these four ingredients. And that equation states that the final velocity to the second power is equal to the initial velocity to the second power plus two times the acceleration times the displacement. And so this is the equation that I will use to solve this problem. Since I'm looking for the displacement, uh, that means that the terms here must be rearranged to solve for the displacement and then plug in the numbers and calculate the result. And so after that is done, the displacement is equal to the final velocity to the second power minus the initial velocity to the second power Divided by, divided by two times the acceleration. So that is 62 meters per second squared minus zero meters per second squared divided by two times 31 meters per second to the second power. And the result is 62 meters. So that is the length of deck that's necessary for this jet to be able to take off from this aircraft carrier. And so one more time, this is the list of the equations of kinematics for constant acceleration. These should be available in the formula sheet that I've provided. So now let's talk about the basic strategy, step by step, of solving problems of kinematics with constant acceleration. So the first step is always to make a drawing. So sketching a problem and indicating the quantities that are known with their values is makes visualizing the, the process um, pretty straightforward and it helps understanding what exactly needs to be done in order to solve the problem. You also must introduce in your drawing a coordinate system in which you must indicate the positive and the negative directions. So a very standard notation is positive direction is to the right and negative direction is to the left. Of course, this choice is in general random, so you can switch the orientations. And as long as you're careful about the signs of the quantities that you're calculating with, with respect to your orient chosen orientations, then you will get the correct answers no matter what. However, one more time, a standard notation is positive direction to the right, negative direction to the left. Okay, so then you will write down the values that are given for any of the five kinematic variables. 
So which ones are zeros, which ones are not zeros, and so on. Verify that the information contains values for at least three of the five kinematic variables. And they identify the desired unknown variable and select the appropriate equation. Then when the motion, uh, motion is divided into segments, remember that the final velocity of one segment is the initial velocity for the next segment. So for some problems, the motion is um, can be uh, complex, which means that it might be more reasonable to split the entire problem into segments in regards to how the object is moving. And so for each segment, you can apply these uh, one of the five equations of kinematics, determine a quantity that's necessary to be able to um, work on the next segment of the motion. And so for the next segment of the motion, you are going to again identify what quantities you know and what you're looking for, select an equation from the five kinematic equations, and then solve the motion for that segment, and then move on to the next segment, and so on and so forth. So in every previous segment, <clears throat> the quantities that you find will be initial quantities for the next segment. So the quantities from a, the, a previous segment are initial quantities for the next segment. And finally, you also must keep in mind that there may be two possible answers to a kinematics problem. What does that mean? Well, for example, in the last equation right here, if you're solving for the time and you know everything but the time, this essentially is a quadratic equation for the time. And so the quadratic equation has two solutions. And so uh, depending on the physical situation, Either both solutions can be correct or only one of the solutions will be correct. So you have to be um, careful what the problem is about, what you're finding, and whether the solutions make physically any sense or not. Um, specific example of motion with constant acceleration is free fall. An object raised above ground and released to fall on its own will always fall towards ground with a constant acceleration and that is also known as the acceleration due to gravity which we label with g and has a value of 9.8 meters per second squared in the metric system or 32.2 feet per second squared in the imperial system the value of the acceleration due to gravity close to the surface of the Earth is constant, and it's shown here. As the distance between the object that's falling towards ground and the Earth is increased, this value decreases. For our purposes, of course, we are going to deal with problems about motion happening close to the surface of the Earth, so the acceleration due to gravity will have a constant value of 9.8 meters per second squared or 32.2 feet per second squared, depending on the measurement system, system used in that particular problem. A factor that also could um, affect the way objects free fall is air resistance. Um, if you consider a sheet of paper, you take two of those identical sheets of paper and you make one into a bow and the other one you keep as it is and you release them to fall towards ground assuming that the um, um, that the regular sheet of paper is not going to spin as it falls through the air you will find out that the paper made into a bow will hit the ground quicker than the other one and this is because of air resistance, since it affects the way the two move. However, if you place both papers in a vacuum and let them fall, you will find out that they both fall with the same rate and they both hit the ground at the same time. So to simplify matters, in this course, we are always going to ignore air resistance. 
and we will never uh, have to deal with the effects of those resistive forces to solve our problems. Now let's write down the kinematic equations of free fall. So these equations are identical to the equations that we've already saw, uh, seen, but um, a small modification must be introduced due to the fact that the acceleration due to gravity has a specific direction, and that is towards ground. So I will uh, show you the kinematic equations of free fall written in two different manners, and you can select which one you like better and go with that one. So the first set, uh, the first version of the equations uh, for free fall will be written in terms of the acceleration A. But here we must keep in mind that the selection of positive direction is vertically up, while the acceleration due to gravity points straight down towards ground, ground which means that when it's used in calculations, the volume must be selected with a minus sign. And so the equations are written as final velocity is equal to initial velocity plus acceleration times time, where for the acceleration you are going to replace minus 9.8 meters per second. The vertical distance of the fall, or motion in general, or vertical displacement, is one half initial velocity plus final velocity times time. The vertical displacement is equal to initial velocity times time plus acceleration times time to the second power divided by two, where you're going to substitute the acceleration here with minus 9.8 meters per second squared. And then final velocity squared is equal to initial velocity squared plus two times acceleration times vertical displacement. Again, here you are substituting the acceleration with minus 9.8 meters per second squared. So it is extremely important that you include the minus in the value of the acceleration when you're substituting in those three formulas. If you forget the minus, then your answer will be wrong. And the second change is the replacement of x as a symbol for displacement. And that is only because now we have vertical motion and we um, label the vertical axis with y, so that's why the change in symbolics. Now let's look at the um, other version of the set of equations in which I'm going to use g as the symbol of acceleration. So here, instead of the acceleration a in the first set of equations, or the first version of the five equations, I'm going to use g for gravitational acceleration, and that is a positive value, okay? So, the final velocity is equal to initial velocity minus g times t. Now, this minus here takes care of the fact that the gravitational acceleration is in direction opposite to what we have as a positive orientation. So this minus takes care of the direction or the orientation of the acceleration. The vertical displacement is one half initial velocity plus final velocity times time. That doesn't change. The vertical displacement is initial velocity times time minus g t squared over 2. And v squared is equal to v0 squared minus 2 times g y. And now again... The minuses here and here take care of the or of the direction in which the acceleration points, and g is simply positive 9.8 meters per second squared. So those are the two versions of the same equations. You can select which one you want to use. If you're using the first version, just always remember to include the minus sign in front of the value of the acceleration. If you select the second version, then you don't have to worry about the minus sign and just g is equal to 9.8 meters per second squared. Here is a simple example of an object that is undergoing a free fall towards the ground. So a stone is dropped from the top of a tall building and after three seconds of free fall, the question is what's the displacement y of the stone or just the vertical distance of the fall. So again, 
my positive direction is vertically up, my negative direction is vertically down. What I know is the initial velocity of the stone, which is meters, uh, zero meters per second, since it was just dropped and not thrown down. And after three seconds of fall, I want to know what is the velocity of the stone. So I can make a table in which I have my five kinematic variables and make a list of what I know and what uh, I don't know and what I'm looking for. So here um, I'm working with the acceleration A as a negative 9.8 meters per second. I know that since this is a free fall problem. The initial velocity is 0 meters per second. The time of the fall is 3 seconds. And I'm looking for the distance of fall. So from my set of equations, I find that this equation here will give me the answer to the question. So initial velocity times time plus one half minus 9.8 meters per second squared times three seconds to the second power gives me negative 44.1 meters. So remember, um, my positive orientation of the vertical axis in this problem is up and negative is down. So this minus here just simply means that the displacement is in negative direction. Okay, so there is no such thing as negative distance. It's just that the displacement is in negative direction. That's all. This concludes the lecture on one-dimensional kinematics. And it is very important that you understand the definitions of the quantities that are used to describe the motion of objects because we can then expand without much trouble into more than one dimension. For example, in two dimensions, which will be the subject of the next lecture.